So, uh, welcome everybody to uh, another Pluriversal Design Book Club. This is our last Pluriversal Design Book Club for this um, academic year. I mean, a lot of us are academics, so we get that, right? And uh, um, today we have Keisha Johnson. Keisha Johnson, who just got an M. 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 Des. M. Des. Yes. <laughs> In, I am um, a master of design. <laughs> yes, father of So I'm actually just going to say hi. Um, this is a Pluriversal Design Book Club. I'm Leslie Ann Noel. Renati, you can say hi, and then we'll just give it over to, to Kisa. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the to one our last uh, Pluriversal Design Book Club of the the, the academic year. And just Kisa, it's all it's all yours. <laughs> So I, oh, okay, okay. Uh, so I got a few slides. Um, before we begin, um, my name, again, my name is Keisa V. Johnson. Uh, I am a master of design. I also do a lot of DNI work. I'm probably best known um, for my immersive course design. I built a lot of uh, large immersive courses. Um, one of the ones that I'm well known for is the Michigan State University zombie course, MSU zombie course. Um, it's one, uh, tons of American advertising awards. It's been a long time since I've created that model. I was a, a co-creator with a, a team of three, um, but the model is still being used for storytelling. Another immersive model I created was um, the MSU Food Futures course, as well as a certificate program um, for uh, the School of Social Work. But I built a lot of, I was a learning designer before I decided to become a master of design. Um, now, I'm working within the field of um, food systems um, and I'm a hyper local community designer. And so I work a lot on different um, farms, specifically black farmers. Um, I'm there to help remove like inequities within the systems and within spaces, within the work that they do. Um, an example is I might go in and help design an accessible hoop house. And I use theory a lot. Um, a lot of my other designers, they tend to not want to do theory, but I feel like, well, then what's the reason that we're doing it? Like, it's a reason, it's a heart center of why we're doing the work. And theory has always been liberating uh, space for me. I grew up at the table with my grandmother when I was very young and she had a garden. Um, I grew up specifically um, on Lake Michigami, which is right on Lake, which is Lake Michigan. Um, I, I'm in the Laurisha uh, biozone when it comes to um, the United States of America, and that's within Michigan. And there's a certain biosphere and hemisphere, um, and Lake Michigami is like has this whole culture within itself. And so a lot of the people during one migration, a lot of Black people moved um, from the South to the North, and my people were part of that second migration. And I would be, you know, outside with my granny early in the morning. Um, with her certain garlic that she raised and a certain um, onions. And I would take it to other people within the, uh, within the community and then they would share food as well. And I remember sitting at my grandmother's table a lot. And that's where theory started for me. It would be her and different people coming in the house and they would be talking about what was going on in the community. And theory was a big part of that because that's how they handled the responsibilities of keeping the community together. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, let's start talking about bell hooks and let's see how the connections um, come into play. And I love to hear some of your stories as well. Okay, so theory. So let so uh, theory is a liberatory practice is really a chapter, just a chapter that's within teaching to trans transgress. Um, I was first introduced to um, Bell Hooksy very young. Um, one of my uh, one of my grandmother's friends, her daughter would come in, and um, they were like, "Oh, she's this big feminist," and I was like, "What does that mean? What is the big feminist?" But I would hear her call out things like we live in a patriarchal imperialistic capitalistic <laughs> white supremacist colonial system and i'm like what is that what are all these systems what is she talking about <laughs> and so 
I finally picked up teaching to transgress. Um, my grandfather had bought it for me because I would always talk about the systems because she introduced the language to me at my grandmother's table. And I felt totally liberated about what education meant to me. And I really, um, it was really heartfelt because I came from an all black town. It was a very small, we owned the water, we owned the land. Um, I had like 15 male, black male teachers. Um, I had a few white teachers. There were like two or three of them, but I, was, I grew up in this incubator of black excellence. And so uh, education was a form of freedom. It wasn't an oppressive structure until I started going to like larger universities. And I was like, wait a minute, what is all of this? So let's talk about it a little bit. So again, 14 chapters, theory is a liberatory practice is one of them amazing work. I love to hear more about what you guys think about if you ever read the book um, and why. I mean, even at the beginning, um, when she starts out, she was like, let me begin by saying that I came to theory because I was hurting. Like there was pain in her and she couldn't go on living. And she came to theory desperate because she wanted to comprehend like what was really actually going on for her as a young child. And I was like, wow. Like how many of us experienced that as a child? And what was that experience like for you um, as a child when you was trying to grasp hold and understand like why you were here and why you were born at such an early day age? Because if we look at the educational structure now, it seems that once we're in the system, that's when we're supposed to be asking those questions. But it's really when you first come out, <laughs> when you first shaped within uh, your, um, your culture and your community and your household, is that like, that's really where like true education starts. Uh, so let me go on. So I really like how she gracefully introduces um, other thoughts not particularly say like from a very academic way, but very fluent ever, ever essence like, well, I learned this theory from T Terry Ingleton, you know, that children make the best theorists, like they have not been educated except in our routine social practice. And so to assist on posing those practices, you know, children, they're just naturally curious. Uh, just naturally, they just ask so many questions. You're like, oh, I have a son, he's 11. And he asked so many questions. And sometimes I'm just like, no, he's just trying to figure out the world around him. So I'm not gonna halt that, um, that practice um, that he's learning. What I really, when I, what really grasped me was that she was desperately trying to discover a place to belong. Like even within her family setting, she was trying to figure out like, do I belong here? Like, who am I, you know? Um, so I got a question if, if anybody read, uh, read it um, or share with like, what do you, like, what did Belle mean when she was explaining the, uh, that hurt um, within theory, like and her making it go away, like how she used theory, like did anybody connect directly with that when she was sharing? Some people did, did does anybody want to share? No. Uh, okay. Well, well I can I can jump in. <laughs> oh, thank you, Trisha. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um I I link this idea of, you know, our personal experiences and uh, the connection to theory as this broader concept of radical self-awareness. Um and I think sometimes in um not not seeing ourselves reflected, like there was something amazing she kind of called out which is simply because we were excluded from these places where um, understanding our experiences and articulating it and um, it, being rep it not being represented um, in a broader sense or canonized or, or reflected within, um, uh, I guess, traditional scholarship um, mm -hmm. kind of uh, concluded with us turning away from those spaces. So the denouncing of scholarship altogether as a result of that exclusion. Um, and I think what she's re-inviting us to or re helping us to reimagine is that um, we can actually make the scholarship richer and a truer representation 
um, of the world because those experiences, those lived experiences of the most marginalized um, are actually the most accurate. So when I think about like a lot in um, a lot of the case, a lot of the cases when people are in therapy, like there's a pain in even understanding the nature of what you've experienced. And then I think there is additional pain in connecting your lived experience with the, the societal pressures, understanding that it's not just your singular experience, but it works within a fabric of marginalization. So while it is painful to go through that and to understand. I think it's also the, liber the liberating piece of it is recognizing that there is that that is the truth that has been suppressed. Um, so that's kind of the pathway that I see and the importance of like that sense of radical self-awareness, um, which is this concept of um, theorizing our lived experiences. Yeah, I had a typo that I had to update. You, thank you. I really, uh, I really like that. And look, here we go. When she was talking about these lived experiences, um, how are it linked to processes of self uh, recovery and collective liberation? Like, like it's it's this gap. A lot of times when we're in education, where um, uh, it's this gap between theory and practice. And like, like what does that mean? Like, like how do you? how do you in your work and here's another question how do you all in your work link theory to practice yeah so i'll, I'll be up front and say that i i failed to do the reading before showing up but i didn't want to to miss the discussion uh one thing i think about uh, a lot is the concept of coherence um things need to be coherent between the the actual lived experience and the theoretical level which kind of relates to the idea that all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? Models are only useful if they reflect the actual experience of people that they're supposed to be describing. Um, and I see that kind of relating here is uh, everything that Trisha said is it, it sounds a lot like the pain originates from a lack of coherence between the models that you're given and the, the way that you experience uh, reality. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, okay, let's go on. Okay, so now she's really talking about these like these terms and what I've come to understand. Like I'm very um, I'm very critical in like in what I do. You know, as a designer, I ask myself a lot of questions before I like engage with anything. It's like series of questions I ask myself. Um, and a lot of times some of them are similar, but then I start expanding that space and it has a lot to do with the language that we're using. And so she says that, you know, these terms like theory and feminism, um, a lot of people don't necessarily practice those things and are having it or live in those spaces or embody the actual actions of it. Um, and, and the practice of theorizing and engaging within the feminist um, structure. And that's real near and true to me. So when, even when I'm speaking with, when it comes to like, when you're working within the diversity, equity and inclusion space, I listen to people. I'm like, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by diversity? And they're like, oh, well, did it? I'm like, but I need a concrete example. Like, how do you do this every day? And a lot of times that's where those crucial inclusive conversations need to happen. Um, because we're missing a lot of this critical thinking. Like a lot of people think that critical thinking is like way out here in, <laughs> in space, but it's really like this everyday thinking of being in a space within yourself as, as Bell um, is saying, like the self-reflective space. Not like I'm just journaling or I'm writing things out. I, I think that's a very active and engaging way um, but how do I do that when I'm actually working with other people? Am I doing the same things? Um, another way, again, oh, go ahead, Lorraine. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to that, uh, that you just said too. And I think that there's something really interesting in it for me. And I've been told this is because I'm a designer is that I, I am too practical, that I'm asking questions that are too too tactical on like what is what are the behaviors that are happening and not so much the like affective or cognitive kind of 
things. And I think because it's the choice, the theory to me lives in the choice. What's the thing that you have actually chosen to take action on and that you're, you're acting on completely? Because that to me is where that, is, that lies. The theory is in why, why are you making that choice? That makes sense or am I just crazy? <laughs> No, 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 we're here, here, here we're at all. Oh, hello, Aziz, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, Kisa, how are you? This is an amazing discussion. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add like, so for me, I'm a, I'm a designer. So like the, I think like the gap between theory and practice is often in the nuance of tangibility and theory happens at scale oftentimes um, and practice happens on the individual level. And I think that that becomes like the huge gap that um, disconnects the thinking of what is happening in the world from what is actually happening in the, in the individual experience that somebody is um, living in. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. That was very rich. Thank you both. Thank you. So here's another share. Like I, I love when she shares um, and introduces new people to me she's always sharing like new knowledge constantly just teach so just just an excellent teacher so when she's sharing about um kate king's uh, uh space when she's looking at things from a very um uh, pluriverse perspective when she was talking about the production of feminist theory and formulating in these hierarchical settings that we're in and how white women with high status and visibility draw upon the works of feminist scholars who may have less or no status or less or no vis visibility without giving recognition to these sources. Um, we'll come back to that because I, I do believe in citing black women as much as possible or citing women uh, period in my work. Um, critical reflection on a cont uh, contemporary production of feminist theory. Um, she starts talking about these like concepts of like what feminist theory is and like what feminist practice is and like how does it occur and how is it so like segregated within these institutional practices and like who gets the privilege of writing these stories like who gets the privilege to write these stories and hear these voices when we're pulling up these articles and these journal articles or or, or the books um that get highlighted like how does that work so a question I have, like for you all, like, what does that mean, Black feminism and white feminism, the academy versus the real world? Like, what are those thoughts? Where do what are those thoughts come from within the work and space um, that you participate in? I can. So, like for me, I um, lots of this is really like relationship to power in relationship to power dynamics and everything is kind of contextual based off of the spaces that you actually are in. Um, and I think that there's an abstraction sometimes when we're talking about the academy or white feminism that starts to um, brush over some of the nuances of real lived world experiences in order to validate its existence. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like, so in, in, in the way that I kind of like frame things like, I'm always just trying to understand like the power dynamic that exists within the context that I'm in. And it's very easy to see like who has the power to, and I guess, and this is kind of like a, a, an idea that I have in terms of like design. I feel like design is the invisible hand that shapes our lived experiences. And so who's the person who has the power to actually design something, the power to publish something, the power to actually um, create um, I guess the the understanding of the world that's then being taught or then being kind of like maneuvered in, um, and and then who is the person who um, has uh, to live in that or has to be um, uh, whose environment is determined by things that are created by the person who had the power to design that environment um, and. And I think that like, that's kind of like the interplay that kind of comes into my mind, whereas the academy is then furnishing also the information that then creates what the people who have the power use to design or create, right? Um, and the, there are other people who then don't necessarily, their information or their lived experiences aren't 
bubbling up into theory. So as this, this plural verse that we're talking about as well, their lived experiences aren't bubbling up into the, into the theory that then gets disseminated to what gets created in the world. Mm -hmm. Is it Rowan? Did I, did I say your name right? Yeah, 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 Rowan. Yay. Um, I'm, I think it's so, such an important and interesting question as well. And I, I think I was very um, taken when I was trying to embed feminist theory into my, um, so I work in the economics department as a designer, which is a strange enough combination in its own right. And then um, trying to look at these different conceits of design justice and looking at the kind of bell hooks critique of feminism when it was just you know effectively Betty Friedan's conceit of being able to say the personal is political and it's real then kind of didn't give any form so there's this constant challenge of form but then that's form whether that's ownership and then power over is problematic you know and what what she I think bell hooks is was kind of saying is you need this ongoing criticality, which is one of the reasons why she's so amazing in being able to give it this visible or materiality in the literature, in theory, which is essential. But then she's, she's also saying, so, you know, the moment you say my lived experience is all there is, is the moment that, that the evolution of that lived experience or the materiality of that lived experience becomes kind of like calcified. It becomes you are living this woe as opposed to your evolving the, the dialogue and you have to keep you know, like busting the binaries so that you can keep making new theory which is really hard but I love that's what I love about bell hooks and she's like you can't just rest on lived experience I think but that's not to say you can't not go to lived experience you have to and I really love that question um that is like how do you allow that I think you were saying bubble up like because interpretation changes everything right as soon as someone is saying when I say your words they become my words I, I always say to my students try not to think about walking in people's shoes because you don't have their feet so you can't do that in that in that way so these questions of, of black feminism and white feminism are things you just need to dwell on I don't have any answers to that but I think that's such a really important space to sit with and I sit with the question I look like a Karen what does that mean you know, I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't know where that puts me in the conversation. I just need to keep being critical about it. So I, 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 I'm really interested in the question. Now I just become really unformed and not saying anything useful. So I'll shut myself up. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you. No, that was great. Thank you so much. for it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, I know for myself, um, I never really thought of myself as a feminist. Um, only when I heard when I was at my granny's kitchen table and I was listening and I was just like, well, maybe I am. Um, but see, identity um, within the space that I come from, um, it was it was a it was more rich, rich within context um, within blackness is so many different parts of us. It's parts of us from the Caribbean, it's parts of us from Africa, it's parts of us from Muskegon, Michigan. Um, the, the dynamic of identity really isn't, um, I guess, not quite as political as it, it is more like more of a nurturing feeling of like, ah, I see you, I see you, I see where you're from. Um, but it wasn't until I got into the academy where identity politics um, came into play for me uh, a lot, a lot more. So, let me keep going. Oh, again, sight black women. Uh I think Trisha raised her, her hand. Did she? Go ahead. Yes. Trisha, go ahead, Trisha. You're also going to have to forgive me. I'm going to be that annoying kid in the back of the class whose hand is always up because this is one of my very favorite books. Um, it even got wet and there's a whole place on the corner. Yes. My son and I will joke that um, I take it in the shower with me. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is vibing with me for all of those reasons. Um, what... As I, I guess I want to talk a little bit about the role of design and the role of academia, because um, Aziz, your point really resonated with me. If we think of the role of designers or designers really um, being the invisible hand that shapes our, our lived experiences, I think we could also think of academia as the space in which knowledge is formulated or constructed. Um, and there's a Actually, I, I did the last book talk from uh, this wonderful um, author, Mina Salami, 
um, who wrote this book, Sensual Knowledge, and she ties um, the link between our narratives of our, or our stories as what gets concretized into knowledge. And then finally, that knowledge manifesting in the, in the built world and services that we construct. And if we think of that trajectory of narratives to knowledge to, um, to uh, tangible and intangible um, offerings or services and products, um, it, it's very, it becomes clear to me that the exclusion of black identities, the exclusion of black stories or the, um, the refusal to integrate um, the narratives of the marginalized is very intentional, right? Because then it doesn't get solidified into knowledge and yeah. it doesn't get uh, constructed into our, our lived world. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that, what's, I think that that point just really um, clarified for me in, in the last few minutes, like seeing that, seeing that continuum and recognizing that um, these stories or uh, representing our stories as theory is really the impetus of literally ensuring that we exist in these spaces. Mm. Mm. I like, thank you, Trisha. That was good. I'm just, look, I'm just seeing Trisha's hands raised now. Like, so thank you, Renata, for helping me. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so a lot of things, I cite a lot of Black women, um, especially within my uh, theoretical work, um, especially as a designer, it was extremely difficult for me um, because it was a lot of pushback because they were like, well, are there Black women designers? Because I was getting thought, taught um, from that basis. I was getting taught from 20th century design where everything was based upon industrialization and everything was based upon uh, white men thinking and gradually white women's thoughts start to get intertwined but I never really heard anything from black women so it was like my goal within my heart when I started my program um, to make sure that I situated uh, black women um, within the thinking and thought of my work in order for it to grow. I didn't want to stay stagnant within 20, 20th century. I wanted to push it a little bit further. And because I was working within the food system and Bill Hooks helped me out a lot um, uh, with this. And that's why I'm sharing this story is that I based a lot of my secondary uh, research on black women who were in the food system. And from there, I followed this wonderful trail of just finding amazing women um, who was doing design work, but necessarily didn't uh, call themselves designers. So cite black women. <laughs> so um, so imagine a change, like, like with feminist movements with students and people who are female and they come to like classes and they read and they're told about feminist theory only know that, you know, they can't understand it or like nothing connects to their lived realities beyond the classroom. Like how, how would that make you feel? Oppressed, <laughs> I know at least oppressed. Um, uh, Michelle, Michelle, you raised your hand. Go ahead. Oh yes, hi. Hi. I guess I have I have a question regarding bell hooks because I've read all of her books and I've used them in teachings and classes. And I wonder how if bell hooks is also looking at the past where she's looking at black suffragists as well as white suffragists and their struggles together. And then I also start to think about um, words that we use like in a classroom where students may or may not understand or have the capacity to really articulate some of the theories or languages. Um, I work in the field as a designer and have done for many years. And I also have taught for a long time, undergraduate and graduate level. And this semester I taught a design theory class. And one of the things I noticed, particularly amongst um, the students of color, is that they really wanted to create projects that identified with their self. So whether it was talking about um, black feminists and how it relates to them as young black women or Latinx designers and not having that information on the table or uh, queer design, LGBTQ and not seeing those issues raised in design classrooms about around creating products and services or designing where that comes into the framework. 
and I've used one of the other books uh, for Bell Hooks that has Paris is Burning, and I've used that to create a project with okay. students. And it reveals some really interesting results, often that bring in a cultural context based on where the students are from and gender, and also their knowledge of the information, because sometimes they don't have the capacity to look back because like you said that material is not there or it's not taught mm -mm. Mm -mm. and even when you ask they were like well that's something for you to do i'm like wow <laughs> wow <laughs> i guess i have to do it right um thank you michelle i, I really appreciate that uh, so again i mean michelle brought us here to this it was a perfect moment um, when she was sharing about how like theory emerges from the concrete. I mean, it, it emerges from our lived experiences, our shared experiences when we're actually being, being able to be who we are or explore more about who we are. It's like this fertile ground for production, for liberatory feminist theory, because usually it's the form and basis of theory making. Um, so I really like this one, <laughs> um, you know, when she's expressing that there are moments in her life that through a part of me is missing. And there are days when I feel invisible that I can't remember like what day of the week it is when I feel manipulated and I can't remember my own name and I feel lost and angry and I can't speak anything. Um, and I have to close my eyes at certain times and remember myself and drawing an eternal pattern that's smooth and whole. I mean, I felt like that going through my design degree, like, where am I at? Who am I? <laughs> Do I fit in this space? Um, and that was, that, was a, um, that was a moment that I felt like, it was another moment where I felt like um, Bell Hooks, like I feel like I know her, I understand her story understand where she's at in the space, Aziz. <laughs> yeah, this is, it's interesting here. And also like, just to kind of touch on a little bit of what like Trisha and Michelle were saying, like language is so important, right? Um, and I feel like even in Bell Hooks' uh, in, in her writing, it's the discovery of how to use language in order to be able to describe her own lived experiences um, into theory. Um, and I think that there's like what Michelle was talking about a little bit in terms of just when the language actually doesn't exist or language actually being erased for you to be able to even articulate your experience, like even the concept of feminism, right? So like is feminism an African concept or an African cultural concept, right? You know, um, these things now are you're given um, a framework to think about your world through. Uh, that you then have to adopt and assimilate to a certain way or try to manipulate in order to be able to um, define your experience, where there probably are the already words in other languages or other ways of expressing that communicate what it is that you're trying to express in a much more like real um, and vital way. And then like on the, you know, when you're talking about citing Black women, it's interesting too, because I feel that when we look at like all throughout history, so like even like 2020 right now, um, when a lot of the uprisings and things were happening, lots of these movements are led by black women. Mm. When you look at like the history of like slavery in America and the heroes that get put into the history books, you very rarely see any black women. And my huge assumption, which I, I don't think is an assumption, is that like majority of the reason that you know the the majority of slave revolts, the majority of that 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 leadership came from black women, but those stories aren't told. Those stories were erased. You know, so like the nuances, and oftentimes I feel like the nuances of um, the things that we want to progressively solve in the world are found in the lived experiences of the most marginalized. Um, but to a little bit of Trista's point, where it's like the erasure of those experiences through academia or theory um, lends itself to maintaining the status quo, as opposed to including it into the um, normalized like knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Michelle? 
Yes, I have one last thing to say. And I don't know if you could ever find it online, but about, I think about several years ago, Noli Way Rokes uh, and some other Black female academics organized a symposium that focused purely on Black women working in colleges and universities that were full-time and seeking, those that were seeking tenure and those that started that actually addressed a lot of the issues that they're talking about um, and having access to information, their scholarship um, being valued and basically you know, how they're treated within these walls of these academic institutions, which tend to be different from their white female or male counterparts. And so I think that's something worth either discussing or exploring those. Yeah. No, even in this chapter, like you said, like even throughout, Michelle, thank you, Aziz, thank you so much. Um, uh, I love hearing what you're saying. Uh, she even said within this chapter about like, you know, a lot of people, um, some people, uh, some of her students weren't able to quote her because they felt like she wasn't academic enough. And she's like the perfect academic to me because she's just she just teaches, you know, just naturally. Um, uh, I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say gracefully, I would say more eloquence because sometimes um, within eloquence, um, it's not this niceness thing that needs to happen when you're teaching, but it's an eloquent way um, to get a point across for many people to understand. Uh, so I would call her more eloquent and very upfront um, with how she quotes, um, as well as how um, she brings you into the space of like this new understanding. So you can start thinking a little bit about your next move and actually who you are. So she says, I am grateful to many women who dare to create theory from the location of pain and struggle, like who courageously expose wounds to give us their experience to teach and guide as a new chart to like a theoretical journey and their work is liberatory. I love that. Um, you know, on my design journey, um, within my design education, I, my whole point was to create theory. Um, but as within design education, we know that that is a wicked problem within itself as well, um, where only certain people can create that theory, or if they don't have the language understanding of like, like where you come, where you're actually coming from, or where you're pivoting, um, it can get lost within the shuffle and within that space, or they're just looking for a novel idea to solve a solution. And for me, uh, I work with farmers and people in the food system and novelty is nothing they wanna deal with. They wanna deal with what's, what's real and what can be sustainable, okay? So here's my end slide and we can, we can talk more about this. Um, so we are fed a lie that there is no pain in war because uh, we are at war in a lot, a lot of things um, that's going on here. And so what does a feminist revolution look like? Does feminist theory fit within your everyday life or just your work? Or how can we evolve our consciousness to be fully present, to actually um, go through that creative tension to take us from one space, one reality to a, lot, a new reality? And so I'll leave that open for us to talk. Anyone? Just something that's that's occurring to me as as I'm you know listening to the the excellent discussion here uh, and and some of the thoughts you're sharing is that I mean it's it's consistent in the movement. I'm a sociology student, but it's consistent in the movement from the old way to the new way that the the past perspective was that there is no perspective in theory; it is perspectiveless. And of course, what we're recognizing now is that it held the perspectives of the people in power, right? Um, and, and therefore it reflected only their lived experience. And now we're trying to figure out how to integrate perspective and experience into, into the creation of theory, which is a, a you know, a, a thorny and challenging issue, especially for those who continue to uh, to insist that there is no perspective, that theory is objective. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel. Rowan? Um, I'll try and build on that and I may 
I'm not sure that I'll make much sense again, but um, I'm interested in looking at holistic materialism because I think that that's quite different from the sort of dialectic materialism, which is sort of your anthropologist way of collecting. Can you share stories. what that means? Can you share so, what that means? So, so the idea that materiality is what gets um, investment, it's what gets citations, you know, so when something becomes a physical thing, it then begets, that's the, I put it in the chat, the thing about the Matthew effect, where effectively it becomes its own phenomenon and because it's material, so knowledge is a product, it then becomes something that can be mass produced or, or mass, you know, accumulate more and more and more citations. So the Matthew effect means that, you know, you are going to, wealth accumulates wealth. Uh, it's this sort of cycle of, and there is a question about how you maintain something like holistic materiality, which mm. plays to the question of, you don't want to create products of, but, but you want to try and work out how you have a, an account of holism and holism, unfortunately, it's very hard to then have money flow into it or have cite, citations flow to it. And, you know, when you're, when you're talking about that wonderful teacher, you know, unfortunately the teaching is, is ephemeral. It's not something that you can make tangible. So therefore it was wonderful for those humans who involved, were involved with it, but its legacy doesn't get in the history books, right? So it's like, how do you have holism that can account for itself. I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explore that question of holistic materialism because the problem with materiality is it's static, right? So the minute you capture it is, the, is a moment and it can't, can't go on beyond it. But maybe there are things like, I don't know, you know, I don't know anything about blockchain, but things like that, that maybe can try and build distributed ledger type stuff. I don't know what I'm talking about at all when I talk about this. But, but how you have holism is accounted for in your materiality. Again, it's late in London, <laughs> so I'm, I'm probably waffling a bit, so I'll, I'll stop again. No, no, you're doing fine. Trisha? Yeah, um, the point Daniel made definitely uh, triggered a thought for me. So the sense that knowing that all theory is subjective, it's also interesting to think about all practices being rooted in theory um, and kind of going back to that initial idea that there is a false dichotomy that's created between theory and practice. Um, and also um, it's, it's very clear that when we live within these oppressive systems, we are subconsciously taking in um, this dominant narrative and that is the theory that drives our behavior. Um, like she calls out in the, the Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman on page 69. Oh, I um, love that, that part. Yeah, and she oh. talks about like that, that, that position, that posture is rooted um, in theories of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So I think she's also inviting us to be uh, diligent about identifying um, the theory that's embedded within um, everything that we might come into contact with in the natural world. So in addition to understanding our own, um, like having this sense of like a, a, an arsenal or a toolkit or what have you, so that we can, we can um, critique and deconstruct the theories that are presented back to us mm -hmm. as objective truths or as um, the actions and the, uh, the tangible experiences that, that we have in the world. Wow. Yeah. Mariana, did I say, say it right? Hello, hello everyone. I am Mariana. Thank you, Leslie, for the invitation. I am loving to listen to everyone's points. Uh, I was just wondering, I am new to the subject, so I'm here to learn as well. I mean, but uh, because I find myself in this space that I am a designer, right? Mm -hmm. That I don't believe that anymore professionally even or as a woman that empathy is the place mm -hmm. and so I went back to Paulo Freire who talks about uh, learning and knowing by dial uh, through dialogues instead that is the place that I found but I really 
I am really loving this conversation. Perhaps what I am, what I am talking about is stupid, but uh, it is the way that uh, I am finding to find myself back to build a knowledge that is more inclusive or diverse, not only knowledge, but how we can cultivate practices and policies that correspond to, to practices that work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. is brilliant. Thank you, everyone. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Great. I'm happy you're here. Aziz, go ahead, Aziz. So yeah, uh, Kissy and I, we've had we've had multiple conversations about this, and like I think that you know some of the things that you, you've heard me say this a lot, but like uh, people are experts in their own lived experiences, and I think that um, you know when it comes to empathy and design, like I really hate this empathy led design kind of thing because all that it really is is that it's codifying somebody else's biases into somebody else's experience. You know, there's no real way for you to sit there and say that, oh, I understand your lived experience and then I'm going to design down on you and tell you what you need in order to solve or deal with your life. And so we're not actually including those people um, into the design process. And, and, and my perspective is that one, that everybody is a designer. Um, as you move through the world, you're making decisions that are actually um, either consciously or unconsciously designing the world or designing the world that you're living in. And so everybody is going to be a designer and design, I start to define more in terms of like care and consideration, who is who and what are you caring about and um, how that gets into the planning of what you actually tangibilize in the, into the real world. Um, and in the, in what bell hooks is kind of like what I take from a lot of bell hooks work is this idea that the world is dynamic, it's not static. Once we start to try to create this idea of universalism, um, that then we have to create an identity of what that universal is. And in this world or in this framework, it's this um, you know straight white man. And then everything needs to fit into that framework. And then everything else that is not that um, is then kind of otherized, right? So like this idea of critical analysis in order to really start to understand our positionality in the world and really start to look at more so like when you think about theory too, it's just like, the, the criteria that somebody has and how they're actually making decisions. Um, and having the conversation more about people's criteria, uh, like oftentimes, like we've all probably been in some like design critiques or things of that nature. And somebody's like, I don't like this or I don't like that or whatever it is. And it's like, if I'm as a designer saying, well, this is the criteria that I used in order to tangibilize or come up with whatever it is that I came up with and you're judging me off of a completely different criteria that's based off of your own lived experiences, then right. the problem isn't you know, the design. The problem is that we have different value sets that we're analyzing things at. Then we need to actually start to critically analyze, our, do our value sets actually align with the context that we're trying to create in or not? I love that you talked about values because I think that is so extremely important, especially within the design space when we're working on projects on like, do values align with one another? And like, what are they? Because you're, you're making decisions based upon your value system. But yet we're not just supposed to talk about that. I, don't, I, I get so confused uh, with no those spaces. Go ahead, Daniel. Oh, no, no, I have to figure out how to lower my hand. I always, things I like get tricky when I- I like yeah. your microphone. I like your microphone. Thank you. It makes people take me seriously. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really interested in the, in the question of empathy as a, as a barrier, because I, I definitely appreciate everything that Aziz just said about how oftentimes the, the empathizing as a, as a design step means that we're interpreting others' lived experience through our own biases, right? If that's a, if that's a, a, a fair way of summarizing what you just said. I wonder if the empathizing step could be reframed as an impetus for better practices, though. Um, by being fully empathetic, we lend more power to those we empathize with. Um, or, right, because that's, the, that's the, the intended purpose of design. And as somebody who's a design student myself, I'm always wondering, um, what are the practices you know, that, that are most effective, because I, I also really appreciate what uh, Dr. Noel has, has talked about with regards to, 
you know, co colonializing uh, others' experiences, you know, colonizing others' experiences by, you know, our own interpretations through our lens. So mm -hmm. I'm curious if there's a better framing, of, if there's a way we could reframe empathy as an impetus for better actions rather than the step through, you know, the the machine through which we process their experiences and come out with design insights. Mm. Mm. Renata? Yes. How I see is that it's impossible to be a designer without empathy. So it's not, not that empathy is something uh, bad and terrible. It's just that it's not enough. And when we frame as this being enough, it, that is the problem. And because empathy as a human capacity has a bias. And the bias is that you are always tuning into the more like the, the, the suffering, uh, the, like the, the negative, the damage, the, the deficit. And it really it creates a bias of how you're going to respond to the situation. So empathy is fundamental, but you have to complement with several other, other things so that you can, can fully use empathy as something beneficial to, the, to design. That, that's how I see that it's, it's not that it's something negative per se, but it, why it is negative, it's because it's framed as the way, the way in all the other things that they have to be around, like uh, awareness of the, the, the structure of, of power. And I always say, okay, you, you, you empathize with the, the, the damage, the deficit, but you also have to, to understand the vision. You also have to, to understand the other parts. For me, that's what is lacking in the, the way empathy has, has been used. Mayana? You're muted, Mariana. Sorry, sorry. I usually do this. Uh, no, I was just wondering about uh, what Renata was saying. I think there are several limitations to empathy in certain circumstances. For instance, I think there are people that have uh, the ability to really truly empathize but instead there are others that will face difficulties or they just, they don't genuinely care. I think it doesn't mean that someone is a designer. He really cares about or is really interested in, in putting yourself in, in someone else's shoes. And uh, also there are some situations that uh, they don't have even the reference of that lived experience to imagine, for instance, we talked about the pain. If you didn't, if you didn't come from certain origin or background and haven't experienced that, how can you say that you feel the same? This is kind of fake. So I think we need to find also alternatives if we want to really change. And uh, actually I'm here to learn more and to know other stuff that I don't, I don't know yet. And uh, yeah, but to find ways, different ways beyond empathy because sometimes it can be fake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Trisha? Yeah, I, I linked in the chat a, a really amazing talk by an anthropologist and researcher, Sakai Farai. Um, I think she really digs into um, that within our field, um, it's not treated as a true practice, but more um, along the lines of a platitude. And just uh, I was able to pull up one quote from her talk. She, she uh, states clearly that there is no empathy in the capitalist production of technology. Mm. What there is, is observation, separation, exploitation, and domination. Um, and I, I think what's really interesting to call out, and I, I think Aziz, you mentioned this, is that positionality is key to this practice. And beyond how we, um, how we are located in the world, there is also the work that we do in order to build an empathetic uh, skill set. Um, which Sakai speaks brilliantly uh, to in her talk. And I'll also add that within the design thinking process, it's not a, a methodology that's driven by empathy. It's a marketing tool. 
Um, mm -hmm. And I think the more we can be kind of clear about where um, our allegiance lies when we work within this capitalist environment, um, it also becomes important to really evolve our language so that it's consistent. I, I know for me, um, a quick example, like part of my research was creating a design process when working and engaging within hyper-local communities. And one step uh, within that process is called holding space. And how I got to the term holding space, I mean, it's not a, a new term. Um, it's a term that's been around for um, centuries at a time uh, within black and brown communities. And uh, it's there for you as a designer um, to actually, like, it's like a container, a liberation, because you're not there to observe. You're there to show people that you're there for them. And you're not there to change the outcome of their experiences. You're there to listen and be there for that person, which is something much, much different, like where Trisha was coming from and a lot of other people, like especially where you were coming from, Trisha, where it is it's much deeper than a commodity. Um, it's a very spiritual act um, that keeps the community and communal connections um, going. And uh, a lot of times, like with, when I was doing holding space and I was bringing that to light, they were like, well, how do you observe? What are you capturing? I'm capturing that time and space with that person and showing them that I'm there for them regardless. I'm not there to cause harm. I'm there for them as a person and an individual. So uh, I don't know who was first. Daniel? Yeah, I was just reminded of something that I really appreciate from the, the methods employed by Cognitive Edge and the, the creators of the Kinevin framework, as well as this, this method of, of kind of sense making and complexity called the sense maker software. One of the methods that they employ involves self ethnography by those who, who you're trying to gather experiences from. But in addition to that, instead of then taking that ethnography and going, I'm going to now interpret it over here as the objective expert, you actually put have them, you empower them to interpret their own ethnography into those insights. And by handing that process of the, the interpretive process, which I believe is where empathy, it sounds like uh, what, what Aziz was describing is where the empathy goes wrong is when you use it at, by, when you retain the power of interpretation within yourself, but you're just gathering their experiences and then you're processing it through your own, through your own quote unquote expert lens. Right. So I think that that, uh, as a practice is one example of a method of, um, you know, it's like in different design methods, there's disseminated versus centralized ethnography, and then there's disseminated versus, eth uh, versus, uh, centralized interpretation. And those, those two stages within design are, are kind of the uh, the most crucial where where potentially that biased uh, interpretation could uh, well abstract away the lived experience of the people you're supposed to be designing for. Aziz, I think Rowan was before me. What was she? Okay, Rowan. You somehow you jumped the queue though. I I, I was interested in how you did that because you did get ahead of me somehow. Um, but uh, yeah. thank you for letting me um, letting me come in. I just thought, I mean, I'm just like fizzing because I'm like, oh my god, this is the most interesting conversation I've had for like ever. And um, my secondary supervisor is a guy called Lasana Harris who runs the experimental psychology department, looking at dehumanization and prejudice in neuroscience, right? And I mean, Jesus, if you look at ne neuroscience and the concept of nudge, and you've got baked in to patriarchy and concepts of dominance, you know, like it's fundamental to the old idea of behavioral economics. But Lasana's work is really interesting because he looks at the cognitive dimensions. That, so he's, he's doing brain stuff, right? Like everyone is now trying to do brain stuff to prove in a very natural sciences way why we do what we do but I put in there this kind of what you were talking about Kisa about your empathic and hosting which I that's how I understand empathy and then I've been really interested just observing service design and a lo whole load of practices and kind of thinking oh my god some of you people are like evil and why would you even how can you even do this like fit in these canvases and basically Lasana in how he sort of 
the way that dividing that recognizing that different people have different brains and that some people have an empathy switch which just doesn't switch on you know so not everyone is entering the room with that empathic capacity or competency and so not everyone sees empathy as compassion so the breakdown that i put in the chat between this idea of cognitive empathy which is i can understand this canvas and that i am objectifying you and i'm trying to understand like who you are as a human being so i can effectively materialize you and turn you into something that is a persona which i think is a tool of evil um or i'm in a hosting space <laughs> where i can we can talk and i can sense into what's going on here but that's deeply rooted in praxis right you can't do you can't turn that into something you can scale so these are really interesting questions of how you how you blend that and what Lasana's stuff is all about, actually how this turns into dehumanization by virtue of, of you know, co turning things into product, you can then ignore it because you turn your empathy switch off. So I would just point you to that work and say, I, I'm loving this conversation so much. Can, can you put the name in the chat? Um, and I then you can put Lasana's name yeah. as well, so we could look him up. I put the link. Uh, um, to maybe I'm going to kind of re reel things in and let Aziz um, maybe make the last contribution. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. I guess tying things back to even what, what, what Trisha was saying and like the idea of how empathy lives within capitalism and how design lives within capitalism and understanding capitalism as a system that's meant to um, observe and exploit in order to um, create value for somebody else, right? And so then design and empathy is starting to be used in that way. So like, I think if we start to think about design or empathy outside of these, outside of capitalism, how, how does design and empathy actually live outside of capitalism? Um, because Typically, what's happening, I think, in the design realm is that there's an observation of um, how an oppressive system is creating inequity for a marginalized community and then identifying an opportunity to sell back the solution to that marginalized community. You know? And so like, <laughs> how, <laughs> when we start to think about um, the intersection between capitalism and design and empathy, we start to see how capitalism starts to um, feed its exploitative kind of um, framework of the world onto all the activities that we're doing. And so can we start to imagine how we would function as, as designers and how we would actually utilize empathy when capitalism isn't the thing that we're actually feeding it into? Right. Um, that is a great point. Actually, Renata and I were in a fantastic meeting with Arturo Escobar last night and, you know, we spoke about that often, you know, how can we redirect design and move it away from capitalism? And maybe that's one challenge to end on. I'm going to be kind of, <laughs> um, I'm pulling strings in the background. And, um, but Kisa, firstly, I'd like to really thank you for this amazing conversation. This has probably been the most vibrant book club for the entire year. Um, so thank you, Kisa. Um, I think it was Bell Hooks. No. <laughs> thank you, Bell Hooks, for opening the conversation. Thank you, Kisa, for, for leading us through this conversation.